Hey there friends, Dave Polite is Can-Am Missing Project, copyrighted edition of our video channel. And this is a Missing 411 Special Missing Person Edition with Huck in the house. You good girl. It's pretty hot outside and Huck is very happy to be in the house right now. She's got uh, a coat that is shedding immensely, but she is very happy to be here. She's been a really good girl. Yeah, she's a good girl. Yeah, she's a good girl. So, without further ado, without waking Huck up any more than normal, <laughs> we are back. And uh, I appreciate you being here. And this is gonna be a lengthy edition. So sit down, grab a coffee, Grab some pastry. Maybe go exercise and put this on in the background. If you're working, put it on and uh, we'll move along. First of all, I got to tell you that uh, every once in a while, someone goes way above and beyond the, the call of duty of the village and sends me something that I'm absolutely blown away by and I uh, try to give people recognition. And uh, a man named Alden, who's a retired nurse, got injured in an accident, broke his back. And uh, Alden was looking for a meaning in life. And sent me a letter. And he said, uh, hey, Dave, I know folks don't actually put pen to paper anymore, but I like to. It's personal. I watched every word you've said. There's no 100% about everything, and I believe about 90% of what you said and agree with it. I wanted to send you this knife for a while, made it with you in mind. I'd love to be close to you as a friend, and my knife, I hope, will be. I'm so intrigued with what you do. And he went on. And I want, to, I want to show you some of the products that this guy makes. They're out of this world. I'm not getting paid for anything on this. I'm just telling you. And uh, I'm a big animal person. And this is Nico and Nadja, his kids, two years ago on a hike. I've had German Shepherds my whole life. They're beautiful dogs. And then Alden sent me this beautiful, beautiful knife. And it weighs a ton. I'm going to use it. Alden, I'm humbled that you would even think about passing something like that on to me. And what I want you to encourage you to do, Alden, is make a post on this video. And I know in the letter you specifically stated that you're not asking for support or an outlet to sell your knives, but your letter touched me. I want you to put something on this video in a response about how people can contact you and get one of these knives because they are outstanding. And anytime someone goes through a catastrophe like you did, being an RN for a long time, getting into an accident, breaking your back, that's horrible being challenged in life. If I can help somebody like that, just like you being out of your way to help me and give me that beautiful knife, post something on this video how people can contact you. And uh, I'll make a comment on it, I promise. So thank you. Well, we woke up, Huck. <laughs> we woke Huck up. She's down here playing with this rubber bone that she has. And she is gnawing away like no tomorrow. We took her to the South Fork of the Flathead last night. It was about 90 degrees at 8 o'clock at night. It was unbelievably hot. And she ran around in that river <laughs> like a crazy girl. So uh, we had a lot of fun. So uh, let's get to the letter section of this show. Hey Dave, I enjoy listening to your videos and hear someone talk to me without yelling or criticizing, so thank you for that. Everyone has a purpose, something deep and big. Others keep civilization running. 
I think people with mental health issues are big thinkers and have the potential to put the pieces together. That's why they are not helped or ignored. I also think some part of the global government is aware, but are either without scruples or don't realize the consequences of delivering humankind to dark forces. Hope this makes sense. I've been fortunate in my life <clears throat> to meet people from all walks of life, people with deep mental health issues. I mean, you could just watch people that have had either mental health issues or thinking impaired or autistic. And some of the abilities that these people have are out of this world, unbelievable. You could put me in a room and try to train me for 50 years. I couldn't do what some of these people do. So I do think that some of the mental health people have the ability to concentrate on things that we don't. And whether that's being able to black out the outside world and just razor focus on one topic, hard to say. But there could be something to it. Hey, Dave, I just want to tell you, and this is the next letter. Hey, Dave, I just want to tell you that I'm sorry for your loss. I've never lost a child, but was engaged three times, and all three passed. Two from overdoses and one in Iraq. Hmm. That's horrible. I know it's not the same, and I pray I will never have to feel the immense pain that you're feeling. I honestly feel I would not be strong enough, but I know who wherever Ben is, he's very proud of you to continue to help so many people as you do. I'm humbled that anybody thinks I'm helping them. And if we as people just showed compassion and care for one another on a daily basis, routinely make it part of your persona, it would help. I'm recently clean and sober. A recovering fentanyl heroin user I was actually about to give myself a fatal overdose when the video of Ben came on. I decided to put it down and go tell my mom. And I'm now back on my meds with COVID. I could not see a doctor and relapsed. I'm glad to say I've been clean ever since and I will continue to fight my bipolar disease and PTSD depression. I literally cannot thank you enough. I didn't realize how bad it was until I was ready to do it. Wow. See, hearing stories like that, and I've heard a lot, that really, really helps me continue on in spite of what has happened in my past. And I'm serious. When I hear that I'm helping anybody, it's humbling. I just started watching all your videos along with Steve and Scott and, <clears throat> and there's these guys that used to be our neighbor but had fallen on hard times and was recently homeless. We try to give him food but he refuses to take handouts so we hire him to mow our lawn because he wants to work for his money. I greatly respect that. He's recently been staying in the alley down the street and found a kitten. So he brought it to me because I take in animals and I feed the strays from the post office down the street. It was about three o'clock in the morning and I heard one of the cats crying outside, which is strange because after they eat, they all go usually back over to the post office. So I'm in my room with my dog and I get up and go into the backyard. I found the cat that was crying and gave it some food and was planning to go back inside because I was in my pajamas and didn't want to be out where people could see me, right? Right before I went back to walk in my house, I hear a kitten crying in the bush right outside the gate from my neighborhood yard. So I open the gate, go outside, and I'm looking for the kitten in the bushes. My dog is acting up, but I assumed it was because of the kitten crying. So I tell her to stay, and I leave her in the backyard as I turn around to look for the cat. Next thing I know, I hear it from across the street in another bush. So. I go across the street and I'm bent down looking in the bush trying to find this kitten. Next thing I know, it's a couple of houses down in another bush. So I'm thinking, how can this cat to come, how can I get this cat to come to me? So I start playing kitten sounds on my phone and I walk down to the house. This continued for about another 30 minutes and not once did I ever see the kitten. But I kept hearing it so I was positive it was just behind the next bush. I was so concerned about getting this kitten, I didn't realize that I was getting closer and closer to the swamp down the street next to my house. 
As I'm coming up to the end of the road, there's a gate, and right behind the gate is a swamp, and I can hear the kitten over by the water. Right before I go, I'm, right before I'm about to go over to the gate to go down where the water is, I get the overwhelming fear like something is telling me to turn around or go home now. Usually, I would just be like, oh, you're just scared. There's nothing to be afraid of. Go get the cat. But after watching all these videos about your, the voice rang in my head and I remembered what you said about do not go out alone. And I thought about this. After I turned around and started walking as fast as I could, I never heard the kitten again. I go back to my house and my dog was freaking out so badly, she literally almost broke out of the backyard, which she had never done before. So I picked her up and she ran back in the house. What freaks me out the most is if something was trying to lure me in the swamp. How did it know I had just gotten a new kitten? And that's what would have gotten me out there over anything else. I told my mom about it the next day, but she said that it was just being melodramatic, so I ignored it and haven't talked about it since until the day when I heard of your video. I don't know what it was. I don't know if I'll ever know for sure, but it literally scared me so bad that I don't even step outside alone anymore when it's dark out. I just can't believe how far I got and I didn't even realize it because it was so focused in the bushes looking for this thing. Just some extra info. I have German ancestry and I've also got some Cherokee blood in my lineage. I also used to be a paramedic but fractured my spine in three places after being ejected out of a car. So I'm disabled now. I just thought those facts would be of interest to you. Thanks for all you do. You're saving many lives in so many ways. You can say my name if you read the email, but it's okay not to. God bless. Godspeed. <coughs> So that story I originally read about the kitten, true story, happened in the Colorado Hills. And I've had some deep talks with that lady. Do not go outside in the middle of the night looking for stray crying kittens. Do not. Okay, next letter. In the 70s, I had a shop teacher who was a Navy EOD man from World War II in Korea and Vietnam. He was very clever. One day, he brought to the shop an item that generally, generally looked like a Sony Walkman. The device was used by his nephew in his drug rehab. It produced pulsed electrical vibrations, and the headphones were placed on the neck below the ears. To operate it, one would turn it on and adjust the volume, volume until you could feel the pulses, then back it down below the level of sens sensation. The device induced production of endorphins, as I recall, to calm down and relax the user. I had two frequencies you could feel, one that was about once per three quarters of a second and the other approximately double that. So I suspect with some research, one could induce this remotely as it is only electrical impulses. Perhaps you would then have a stun device that could drug someone with their own body. The device came from the Betty Ford Center. Fascinating. Fascinating to think that something like that exists to stun us in this admission. Hey Dave, just a thought to make people think about what's happening with the missing people and the dogs not being able to pick up a scent trail. What if whatever or whoever is taking people is laying down a scent blocker? Like what blocks ants and mice from following their pheromone? Scent trail so the others cannot follow it. Thanks, just a thought. What do you think about this? You probably already thought about it, but I haven't seen it brought up anywhere before. So, it's usually a multi-prong approach on search and rescue. You've got canines that are going out to look for a scent trail, but you also have professional trackers that are looking for very subliminal signs of someone being through that area. And obvious signs would be <coughs> Big shoe print, heel, but they're much more much more subliminal than that. Little broken twig here and there. Professional trackers can track anyone through almost anything. So, scent trail is a data point. It's not a for sure. Hey Dave, I hope this email finds you well and safe. I had a story told to me the other week, which I found very interesting, and I believe our villagers will too. 
I was telling a friend, Steve, about your channel, and he said it reminded him of an incident that happened some years back. He was just leaving a friend's house late at night somewhere up north here in the UK. The house was situated next to a railroad track, which was still being used, and as Steve started to walk back home, he heard someone running along the tracks, but he could not see anyone there. The tracks were quiet, visible from where he was, and further along the side of the tracks were some very big tall fern trees, which to his amazement were parted to the side and then went back again as if something very strong and big had just gone through. He stood in amazement and then ran the rest of the way home very confused. Keep up the great work. You have the truth out there. Please send my love to Huck. So, you gotta remember, I've told you stories about this before where people see something invisible coming through an area, spreading the weeds, but they can't see anything. So what is it? That is the million dollar question. Now, Huck just walked out of the room. Let me see where she is. And there she was, out there getting into trouble. Yes, she was getting into trouble. <laughs> okay, next letter, Dave. I know you have asked before how some people in a dream or have a feeling that they know where a missing person is. When you're talking about how detectives are different and search dogs are different, well, same goes for people in general are developing intuition. Some are natural, some never believe because of programming. So how, how can they be open? They are defeated before they begin. The fact is that some people are further down the road than others. Everyone is different in their skills. 100% agree. 100%. I've got a big problem though with people who claim to have an ability and who claim that they can use it at will and then would put under a microscope and don't do squat. And again, I've told you that I have entertained and worked with some of the most famous, famous remote viewers in the world and they never did squat. If they were so successful, tell us a list of missing people they found. That list is very small. I can do it with two fingers. None. That's right. Nobody out there who's a remote viewer who has these special abilities that claim they've gone all over the world cannot find a missing person. Just the facts. So, next letter. Good evening, Dave. Hoping Angie, Huck, and yourself are doing well. We are doing very well, thank you. Much needed rain in Wyoming, but Mother Nature could have spread it out a bit instead of flooding Yellowstone. Just a quick email I wanted to send you. This sounds crazy, but my daughter, who is a molecular biologist, was telling me about this newest season. Don't go over there. Don't go over there. Come on. Come on. No, no, no. Oh, this dog knows when I'm on film, I'm... My concentration is with you. She knows that this is the time when she can go in to get into trouble. I swear to you, it's true. Hey, Hawk, Hawk. Now she's over here. Oh, this is unbelievable. Come on. Come on. Folks, you get, would not believe how smart this dog is. It is unbelievable. Okay, now we're, you've got my attention permanently for the rest of this video, I promise. My daughter's molecular biologist was telling me this newest season of a show on Netflix, Stranger Things, and it made me think of your research. You may have already been down this road with your team of physicists, but in the case, in this show, an entity is using people in their souls and that they're made up of water to create a portal. The human is the portal. During this process, the victim is lifted into the air and dropped to the ground. They are found with injuries of a fall but nowhere to place. Friends, I've heard this a thousand times. The brothers who wrote Stranger Things, I've had hundreds of people write to me and say, those guys had to have read your books. The alignment of your stories and their stories are so keen, they're unbelievable. Now, will the brothers ever admit to it? Never. It's just the way the world is. 
there's a lot of people who have no no integrity. They don't want to admit that they might have gotten an idea from somebody else because they don't want to give anybody else credit. Thank you, Dave. I'm always appreciative of the time you take to read emails and care for the family still looking for answers. As always, many prayers and blessings to you. Thank you. Okay, this one, this letter's a good one. So, put your feet up, relax, take a big drink of coffee, and be ready. Dave, I'm a big fan of your work. I follow your YouTube channel since it started, and I've read several of your books. I originally did not want to share these stories publicly, but after seeing your latest video, I was astonished to see you reading a letter about an encounter with a large praying mantis being. And I want to say thank you for sharing these letters at the beginning of your video. Anyone that thinks that we don't need to hear these letters needs to pay closer attention because I've never heard you read one that wasn't thought-provoking. Well, thank you for that. I kind of pick them that way, to bend your mind a bit. These mantis, mantis beings do in fact exist, and they're extremely powerful as well, as I will explain. But I do have some background info to explain first. So before I go any further, again, long-time MUFON investigator, Let me stop for a second. I'm not getting paid for this so I can talk about it and say what I will. This drink right here, Zevia Organic Tea, sweetened black tea, no sugar, zero calories. One of the best drinks out there <clears throat> that I have found. No sugar, tastes just like a regular iced tea, if not better. I encourage you to try it product endorsement that I'm not paid for. Back to the letter. Ever since I was a kid, I knew that my mom was terrified of insects. My dad was always the one to come kill bugs for her, and I figured that was normal. She always blamed her phobia on her childhood memories of visiting Mexico, where they had lots of large bugs. So I didn't think much of it. However, one time I came outside when she was gardening, and she discovered a praying mantis hiding in our tall grass. She was unusually scared of it and mentioned that she didn't want to be anywhere around it. I remember every time she has seen one because she is afraid of them far more than any other bug. I used to wonder why. It seems like an unusual bug to be afraid of, right? Eventually, she told me a story that made me understand why it was this bug that scared her more than anything else. I've always been a highly open-minded individual. I began having an interest in UFOs in my teen years. Teen years. I watched tons and tons of TV shows and documentaries about UFOs and abductions. First of all, if you're a follower of this show, don't watch tons and tons of videos on TV and, thing, and think that they're all 100% right or true. Please don't. I learned about all the famous cases and even looked into obscure stories through many different sources. I went pretty far down the rabbit hole. I even witnessed a UFO myself in 2018. I was driving in US 33 between Logan and Nelsonville, Ohio. Saw an extremely bright light in the sky at a distance. As I got closer, the light seemed to be shining downward and I thought it was a helicopter with some spotlights because it was traveling very low and slowly. However, as I got even closer, I realized it was not at all what I was expecting. I drove directly underneath this craft, and as I look up, what I saw was a black equilateral triangle with a very bright light in the bottom of each corner and one bright light in the middle, about 200 feet above me. I was so close, there was some faint daylight left, so I was able to see some detail, but only a few seconds. I was able to see many different little tiny lights and what looked directly like circuitry in between the bright lights on the bottom of the craft. It had a highly futuristic aesthetic, but it also had a red and green tail light on the backside of the triangle like you could see on a normal aircraft, seemingly to try to make it appear as a normal plane or helicopter. Absent the red and green light to the rear, this story is very similar to something you're gonna hear from me in the very near future. Pay close attention. One thing that I have correlated from the sighting in your work is that the craft was flying very low and slow on a path directly over some of the most remote areas of Ohio. 
I looked on a map and the direction this craft came from and the direction it was going would suggest it took a path over Hocking Hill State Park, possibly Zaleski State Forest, and was heading deep into the Wayne National Forest. <coughs> Important points. In a highly populated state, state like Ohio, these craft could regularly take flight paths over national and state parks and wilderness areas to avoid detection. Or maybe it could be because they're more likely to find potential victims to abduct out there. The only reason I saw it was because it just so happened to pass over a, highly, a highway momentarily. I eventually related this story to my mom because she would often watch some of the UFO shows with me. What I did not expect at all was that sharing the story with her made her open up and share her own UFO encounter. I feel like there are so many people out there that have seen or experienced something and because they are afraid no one will believe them, they keep it to themselves. But me saying I've seen one was all it took for her to open up and, disc and talk. As someone who has also done lots of independent research on UFOs and abductions, I heard lots of correlation with other cases, so I did not doubt one detail about what she told me. What she said was, as a teenager and as a young adult, she was regularly abducted by beings that looked like a large praying mantis. Instantly, it remembered, instantly I remembered all the moments she was terrified and those bugs and I listened very, and those bugs and I listened very closely and even asked her some follow-up questions. She said that as a teenager, she regularly went hiking in Stroud's Run State Park in Ohio, which has a lake and a sandy beach to swim. She told me she would often go hiking or swimming there and suddenly find herself in a daze and realize that hours had passed without her noticing. She said that she had no idea what had happened to her at first, but she eventually would have dreams that filled in some of these gaps of missing time. Dreams of being taken aboard a UFO and being medically tested by the mantis. She told me that this is why she notices a bump on her or something abnormal on her skin. She always picks it that is to get it off her. I believe. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Here we go. Stop it. I believe she was implying that she thinks she had gotten implants placed under her skin and became paranoid about anything out of the ordinary. Could this be one? I asked for details about the beings, and what she told me was that they looked identical to a typical praying mantis, but much larger. She said she said they would speak telepathically only and that they would put her and other human kids and young adults in a room with a smaller mantis being that seemed like it was a child too that could relate, or relate better to them. She said it even had a name, but she did not remember it. What is even more strange is that she told me she found out her brother was also having identical dreams when she spoke telepathically with the same smaller mantis being of the same name. I was so shocked hearing my own mother saying these things, so I wanted to press her for more details. I said, did they ever leave behind evidence of that they took you? Surprisingly, she said, yes. Hold on to your seat, Dave. I'm holding on. She said that she had a pregnancy before me that came unexpectedly and also vanished unexpectedly. She told me she went to a doctor and had it confirmed, but many months later on a return visit, the baby wasn't there. She explained that the doctor was extremely suspicious of this and almost had her investigated for having an unlicensed abortion. My mind was spinning from the implications of this, if true. Do I have an older sibling that was taken by these mantises? Why have two members of my family been targeted? Have I been abducted before? I don't recall it. It's almost like she was used for some kind of, to incubate a human or possibly hybrid baby. So I've heard of this dozens, maybe hundreds of times in my work with MUFON. Does this surprise me? Absolutely not. I was fully intrigued at this point, so I asked, why did they stop taking you, or did it ever stop? Hold on to your seat again, Dave. This answer was one that I truly never expected. Hey, hold on again. I could back at it. I can't believe it. Okay, now she is back in her confinement here with me. I asked her, why did they stop taking you or did it ever stop? She said, yes, it did stop because I figured out how to kill them. I was absolutely shocked by this and I wanted to know how she did that. So I asked, 
She said they are so powerful with psychic abilities that they can freeze you like a deer in the headlights mentally, and being scared of them makes it easier to put you out in that state. They can even go into your mind and compel you to forget certain things, as this is the case with most abductees. However, she said they have a much harder time controlling your mind when you focus your thoughts on complete and utter rage and the desire to kill them. Something I've never heard before. That's, it. That's fascinating. She said you have to vi visualize literally killing them and focus all your material energy and they won't be able to control you. She said they're just like bugs and their heads are soft, so I squash their heads. I can't imagine how absolutely cringeworthy doing that would be and how much determination that took. I asked her why she wanted to kill them. She said because they had been meddling with her life for so long that she was finally tired of it and wanted to put an end to it. Hearing this story from anyone else, I would have been highly skeptical, but because it was coming from my own mom and I knew of her unusual phobia of praying mantis, it was wild. Now I, don't raise, I, now, I want to raise some questions that relate to the experience to possible connections with 411. I think one thing we all need to think about is if extraterrestrials have the ability to influence the mind of the average human to a fairly great extent, what all can they do to us? Can they make us think we are lost or somewhere when we are not? Can they cause someone to feel sick and make them want to turn back and separate? Can they convince a religious person they are hearing the voice of God? Thank you for taking the time to read my letter. I know it was a long one. The overall message I want to impart on the village is if you encounter one of these things, do not be afraid. Understand that your own mind has power as well and you are not helpless. You are able to question their motives by raising that question in your mind, but who knows if you will get a good answer. As far as what I have read on the subject after hearing my mom's story, they are typically cold and calculated beings. They do not consider the feelings or emotions of humans they abduct because they see us as testing subjects. They see us as a means to accomplish their own goals and cannot relate to us. Well, folks, that was scary. I've heard, I read that story because there's a lot of things in it I've heard from credible sources. I've never heard about killing the praying mantis. That's a new one on me. But we're going to go right into the stories of missing people. And we're going to jump right into the fire on just something that I've never talked about before. So here we go. So a gentleman by the name of Robert Osborne, 26 years old, went missing June 27, 1910 in British Columbia, Canada. He was described as a brilliant businessman in real estate and timber sales out of Vancouver. He owned a company called Osborne, Trousdale, and Osborne. And his job was to travel around Canada and broker deals on large tracts of land for timber and general real estate. And he generally dealt in large sales. And at 26 years old, he was thought of as someone who was cutting edge. <clears throat> well, The track of land and the timber he was looking at was six miles up and inland from Toba Inlet in British Columbia in the Tehuming Creek area. And he was traveling with another business associate named David Taylor and they have traveled around together before. When they were on this track of land, this is where it is. This is up the BC coast Look up Toba Inlet on Google. Do it. You will not believe how absolutely gorgeous this area is. It's very remote. Lots of water, fresh water, with pristine grounds. And I mean that sincerely. It's an area of British Columbia that not many people go to. 
It's not an easy trip. Not a lot of reasons to go there. No big cities. But absolutely gorgeous. Well, David said that he and Robert got separated. He looked around all day, couldn't find him. Made it back to their camp next to the ocean. A couple days later, a uh, boat crew came in to get the pair and David advised him that Robert was missing. Immediately, they got all the loggers and people from that area. We got about 50 people there within a day. Searched for three days. And they said they found no evidence of animal predation, no evidence of Robert being in the area. They found nothing. July 5th, uh, Robert's company got together a hundred people, went back into the area and searched it in a grid pattern in the area where David last saw Robert. Again, no evidence of predation. It was a systematic search. The comment from the searchers was, it is impossible to get lost here. I don't see that very often, but I pay attention when people say that. Because everything leads downhill to the ocean. You follow the bank of the ocean back to camp in your home. They said it is impossible to get lost. Now, I have to be careful how I say this. But when I heard about Toba Inlet, it immediately reminded me of a story. A stunning story from 1924. And... It involves a man named Albert Ostman. And if you are from the Sasquatch or Bigfoot world, you know this name, Albert Ostman. So, here's a bigger map of the area. So, this is Vancouver right here. You go north up the coast. This is the area where Robert disappeared. And this is the Albert Ostman case, 50 miles north. Very, very, very remote, even today. So let me explain it to you. Albert was a Canadian prospector. And he was born in 1893. He died in 1975. He was 31 at the time in 1924 when he was in this remote region prospecting for gold. And he stated that in this place he was camped in the nights prior he knew something was coming around for him he said originally he thought it was a bear but then he saw strange tracks he didn't know really what to make of it and then one night his entire sleeping bag was picked up carried over something shoulder he couldn't get out and he was carried for hours, he described, hours and hours, until he was dumped out in a cave. And he said that it was a family of Sasquatch. It's a very long and interesting story. He went public with the story in 1957, years, 10 years before the Patterson-Gimlin film even came out. To me, that added more credibility to his story because there's really nothing to gain. Now, there's interviews where, uh, that are online where you can watch Osman tell a story. Now, the reason I'm telling you about it is because this disappearance of Robert Osborne was just 50 miles away from where Albert Osman said he was abducted and taken. Now, I am not claiming that Robert Osborne was taken by Sasquatch, but I'm also not an idiot. I do believe the Albert Osman story, and I think that most researchers believe it as well. There are things he said about the family of Sasquatch that for 1957 hold up today. I think that 
If I told you a story and I knew of a UFO sighting right over the site, I would lose my own personal credibility if I didn't tell you about it. So, on the Osborne case, he was never found. But when searchers say it's impossible to not find your way out, and they have never found Robert, what could have happened to him? Yeah, it bugs me. So, go to another case. This is in Maine. Man's name was John McGee, 38 years old. He went missing on October 25th, 1966, in Healed Pond, Maine. That's right, Healed Pond. Now, this is a picture of Maine. Heel Pond, where he disappeared, is right here. This is the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean. Now, so he was a chemical engineer and he was described as brilliant. And the two years prior to October 66, he was in Italy working. And he came back to his home in Rutherford, New Jersey. And he met up with some friends and he wanted to go hunting. That was hot. She's very, very <laughs> complete. She's like, imagine like a three-year-old kid who has no conscience about anything around him. That's kind of the way she is. She's got this rubber toy and she's shaking her head. She doesn't care where she is. Uh, so anyhow, Robert, uh, John McGee. And he's with his three, three friends. One of them he knows really well. The other two are friends of his buddy. And they get to Heald Pond late on October 23rd. And his friend said that they got in late. The next day, they scout the area. They don't really do any other hunting. And the next day, on October 25th, his friends put him in a hunting stand. And what they say is that they're going to push the deer down to him, make it easier for him to hunt. Friends, do you know how many times I have told you a similar story where hunters put someone in a stand or they put him on a rock and they say, hey, we're going to push things towards you. Just stay put and make it easier for you to hunt. Well, if you've watched Missing 411, The Hunted, you know that this exact scenario played out in that film. Well, needless to say, his buddies arrive at about four o'clock. John's nowhere to be found. But at about that time, they hear two shots. And they didn't think there were any other hunters within many miles. So they thought that maybe this came from John. So they shot back, didn't get anything, called his name, didn't get anything. So they call the main warden service. And they put together a huge search effort for this professional. Uh, one pilot for the warden service flew 17 hours until light snow started to fall. They had to call off the flight, air support. They brought 25 wardens in from all over the state and then recruited 50 hunters to look around that entire area in a concise grid pattern trying to find John McGee. Now, they said he was in good shape and they never found him. And they had multiple searches after the event and in the following years even looking for him, didn't find him. So in this incident, you have a point where his friends put him in the deer stand and then walk away, point of separation. You have a subgroup where he is a hunter. And then you have light snow that covered up possibly any tracks and grounded the flight teams. Another point is he was never found. And then you couple of the last thing is 
they're on the edge of Hill Pond water. So this was John McGee. Now, interestingly, as I'm doing research on John McGee's case, they talk about a case earlier in the year where another individual disappeared just 78 miles southwest of where John disappeared. Well, that's pretty darn close. And that, and I'm sorry, 78 miles northeast from where John McGee disappeared, and that was Frank Hopkins. You kind of see the, the map there. So Frank, this is, this story is even stranger than most. And, it, and most of them are pretty strange. Frank was 79 years old, in good health. He went missing August 22nd, 1966. John went missing October 25th, 1966. To say something strange was going on in Maine, uh, near the back half of 1966, I think it'd be fair to say. So Frank was a lifelong resident of the area where he disappeared. Many of the articles said he was from Detroit, Michigan. It wasn't true. He was from Detroit, Maine. And he was a World War I veteran. In his life, he farmed. He was an excellent woodworker. And he was retired. On August 22nd, he was riding in a Jeep with a friend north of Troy, Maine. And it started to rain really hard. Well, the Jeep got stuck in the mud. The guys couldn't get it out. And they decided to walk out of the area. And as they're walking out, Frank gets tired. And he tells his buddy, hey, I'm just going to go back to the Jeep. And I'll wait for you. And his friend says, are you sure? And he says, yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> so Frank goes back to the Jeep. His friend walks out. About five hours later, his friend returns to the Jeep. Frank's not there. They look around, they're trying to find tracks, and it rained so hard that most of the tracks were washed away. So, it calls the warden service. The next day, Dow Air Force Base sends a group of soldiers, sends helicopters, sends planes, and a five-day search and rescue with 30 wardens and military personnel. They don't find anything. Well, that's pretty odd. So Frank Hopkins, 79 years old, is missing. And they had searched all that area in a grid pattern, meaning they break it up. Everybody has eyes on the ground. They walk shoulder to shoulder so they don't miss anything. Which is the right way to do it. Well, pay attention to this, folks, because in many of the cases I talk about, many of you don't really get it. But I'm gonna I'm gonna make it so that you do understand. Frank is found on November twenty seventh. Disappears on August 22nd. On November 27th, the adjoining county where he disappears is Somerset. And a Somerset County deputy off duty and two friends that are hunting come across a body in the middle of the woods. The body was nude. Frank's pants were 30 feet from the body. His hat was 50 feet from the body. His other clothing was never found. And his body was near a small brook. The sheriff was interviewed about the case. And he said that he could not explain why the body was nude. And he also stated that the body was found a few feet from the location where search and rescue headquarters were located on this incident. You read that correctly. 
It was also the location where Dow Air Force Base set up their command post. Now, August 1966, Maine is pretty darn warm and humid. Frank Hopkins was 79 years old. Why would a man strip all of his clothes off? A man wouldn't. Let's be honest about this. There was no hypothermia. Now, this is a map I made up for you. So Frank's resident, residence was in Detroit, Maine, up here. He disappeared in this area. Lots of water, very near a large pond, just north of Troy. Right next to water, folks. He was found near dried up brook. In this case, water, point of separation, area previously searched, missing clothing. How many times do I have to go over this with you? Many. Missing clothing is one of those strange things along with having clothes on inside out, backwards, that I will continue to beat the drum about. Many people in the world don't want to even acknowledge it. And that is troublesome. A lot of people in the missing persons world, a lot of people in the search and rescue community, don't even want to think about it. They will sign it off as, oh, it was hypothermia. Yeah, even though it was the middle of August and it was humid and 80 degrees outside. Yeah, nice try. I get frustrated with this world sometimes. Sorry. So, the next case is in a cluster of missing people. Northern Michigan Peninsula. I've talked about it many times in the past. Uh, when I first found this case, I couldn't believe it. It hit every button I know of. Person was German. His name is Lester Schaefer, 70 years old. He went missing May 24th, 1974 on Drummond Island in Michigan. Now Drummond Island has 60 miles of ATV trails, 1,058 residents, 83,000 acres, 34 inland lakes, 140 miles of shoreline, and about 133 square miles of forest. This is Drummond Island. Right here, I'm gonna guess that some of you recognize this. This is the Air Force Base where the missing Air Force fighter that I talked to you about that was piloted by Moncala that disappeared just north of here chasing a UFO out of Canada. I've written about it in my books. But this area is a huge cluster of missing people. So, why did this one get my attention? Lester was picking mushrooms with his 15-year-old grandson. He lived in Edwardsburg, Michigan, not far from the grandson, and he would take him mushroom picking on the southwest portion of the island. Well, near the end of the day, his grandson said he was getting tired and he said he was going to go back to camp. And about the time he got back to camp, the temperature started to go downwards and they started to become freezing. His grandpa didn't show up. The next morning, he calls the Chippewa County Sheriff and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. I've had many cases where Chippewa County Sheriffs were involved. The sheriff was smart. He recognized that something wasn't right. And he immediately enlisted the 
assistance of Kinchlow Air Force Base. Yes, the same Kinchlow where Moncala flew out of when he disappeared. And he ordered up planes, helicopters, and canines. Articles stated that the teams that were searching Drummond Island were searching shoulder to shoulder for miles. And at one point, the canines did pick up his scent, and they searched it right into a swamp. Well, all of you know you're not going to find mushrooms in a swamp, and I'm sure Lester Schaefer knew that as well. So the idea that he voluntarily walked into a swamp, not realistic. Now, May 31st, seven days after Lester disappeared, the uh, sheriff in Chippewa County said that uh, rain halted the search and rescue attempt. So in this incident, you have weather, you have a mushroom picker, which is a subgroup of the missing. You have point of separation when his grandson leaves him. You have water, swamps, and you have canines that couldn't follow the scent. One more thing. As I've told you before, here's Kinchlow Air Force Base. This is the cluster of missing people in the northern Michigan Peninsula. This is the U.S.-Canadian border, and there are tons of people missing in this area of Canada as well. And there is Drummond Island. You might want to look that up online as well, because what you're going to be is you're going to be duly impressed with how gorgeous it is, how remote it can be. And that area of Michigan has so many missing people. In fact, I will say that the entire state of Michigan scares me. I've talked to you about several clusters in that state. Uh, and the strange thing about Michigan is they have a lot of people on the ground missing, a lot of people in boats missing, and a lot of people in the air missing. It's like it's the complete missing person scenario you'd find in land, air, and water. And one of the most famous airliners to ever disappear and not be found Northwest Orient plane disappeared on a flight over Michigan. Never found. So yeah. Now sometimes I get comments on my videos that, hey Dave, do more current cases. Do more current cases. Do more current cases. Well, sometimes it's hard to do a current case when you don't know if it fits a 411 cycle and you sometimes don't know until all the data is in after a year, two years. I've told you before that many of the missing persons cases you hear about in the news are suicides. And that information usually doesn't come out immediately. After the body's found, it does. It comes out through coroner's reports. But to save the family from embarrassment, et cetera. The, more times than not, the family doesn't even want to tell search and rescue that they fear it might be a suicide because they're thinking that search and rescue won't go out and search. So first of all, this summer has been a pretty quiet uh, summer for missing people fitting our profile. And that's good. And maybe if people are carrying personal locator beacons, carrying a firearm, walking with others, hiking with others, and notifying others where they're going to be, maybe it's all starting to work a little bit. I know that personal locator beacons are being talked about more and more by Search and Rescue and by the National Park Service even, which is outstanding. So maybe we're having just a little bit of an impact. In my prior video, I told you that we have had hundreds of people write on videos that they are not getting notified by YouTube when my videos come out. It's a form of censorship. Rather than just censoring me and taking me off the air, they're just not notifying subscribers that I'm on. That reduces my number greatly. And it hurts. It hurts a lot. But, you know, YouTube doesn't care. So what I need from you 
is make sure you follow me on Truth Social, Twitter, Facebook, and we usually post there when we have a new video coming out. Don't count on YouTube to be notifying you. And don't. But in the meantime, thank you for being here. Hopefully you finished the Danish in the last hour that I, we've been on. Maybe you had a second cup of coffee? Time to go to the bathroom now? <laughs> but thanks. Thanks for the support. Thanks for your kind words and comments. I always encourage you to give a thumbs up on the video if you like it. We covered four very unusual cases. Two within 78 miles of each other in Maine the same year, 1966. We crossed some ground today. We talked about the first case of a missing persons near a confirmed case of a supposed Bigfoot abduction. Never did that before. And we talked about Lester Schaefer, Drummond Island, Michigan, disappeared in a cluster of missing people and was never found. Please take this video and put it on your social media. I would be humbled if you did that. If you come across someone who's in need, mental health wise, help, homeless, give a helping hand. By the good grace of God, there go you and I. Really. So thank you. Take care of your family. Be kind to your neighbor. And let's pray for our country. Pull this out. <laughs>